Extraordinary Phenomena Investigations Council presents Epic Voyages. Come join us as we enter and experience the great mysteries of the world with tonight's host, James Clarkson. James and Peter, good evening. This is Tom, and I do consider it an exceptional honor to um, appear tonight. It was the last thing I would have thought three weeks ago that would have ended up on my agenda. But because of the extraordinary uh, display of things that I and others saw the night of June 8th, uh, I felt it the duty as an American and just as someone who has observed the celestial stars forever, um, I'm substantially into my 50s, and when I made the report uh, with some trepidation, I wanted to tell what I saw and then relay uh, whatever detailed information I could to those like you who have spent a, a great amount of time uh, gathering data, analyzing data, ruling out false reports, hoaxes, those who would call up and uh, just play a game with you, and I certainly am not one of those. And, Number two, I'd like to say that being in the presence of two gentlemen that I have learned through my own research uh, are the real deal and have done your own homework is a, a great honor for me and certainly an unexpected one. Uh, this particular night, I've been going to Pauly's Island since I was four years old, and I'll be 54 in about three weeks. And I've seen a lot of things down there. I've spent a lot of time gleaning the sand, uh, searching for shark's teeth, and I'm proud to say I've collected perhaps 3,000 or more, and it does take, you know, a close eye and some steady hands to, to find these things, but I've also uh, had the great pleasure of lying on my back in a, a beach chair at night watching some predicted meteor showers, the, the magnificence of which there's no description for, and, and it just reaffirms to me and others who have witnessed these things this incredible expanse that we occupy a tiny moat of. And those several uh, meteor sh sh uh, showers that I've seen have left me walking away with, you know, just some awe as well as some humility about how small we are in this vast cosmos. And the night of June 8th was one that will stay with me for the rest of my life because uh, I, I did observe something very clearly, very directly, very abruptly, that absolutely floored me. And I can say I've been an observer all of my life, and certainly in my professional career I've been someone who has paid very close attention to details. And what appeared to me that night at approximately 930 was unlike anything I've ever seen and probably anything I will ever see again. Uh, I was out on the front porch of an old historic house that we have rented for the last eight or nine years that looks directly into the Atlantic, and it was a beautiful night, absolutely a gorgeous night with a partial moon appearing, and uh, stars, there was a little haze, but not much at all, and I was talking with this 82-year-old father-in-law of mine about some fairly serious things, and when I took a moment to let him respond, and I kind of broke away from trying to look at him directly above his head in the exact spot where I was looking in the sky, four of these incredibly perfect, perfectly aligned orange globes appeared, and it was as if someone had switched on a light. And these things just, they, they were brilliant. They were, they were dynamic looking. Uh, as I said, being an observer, I, I saw no sort of smoke trail going up. Uh, I instantly thought, geez, those are flares. There's a boat in trouble out there. But it took about a nanosecond for me to rule that out when I said, this is unlike anything I have ever seen in my life. 
and they hung there. They, they were perfectly aligned over the horizon. Um, they were, as I, as I would say, if I stuck my rather large hand out from my vantage point over the ocean, they were about the width of my flattened palm holding in front of my face at arm's length above the horizon, and they were they were perfectly spaced and just awesome. I mean, literally awe-inspiring. And as I've said uh, to Peter in a couple of conversations, I don't startle easily. And I've seen a lot of different things that would probably make most people startle. This rattled me the second I saw it. And I, I, I almost leapt up out of my chair and began asking my father-in-law, please turn around and look at these. Please, please look at these. And about the same time as I was doing that, my uh, my two brothers-in-law were coming off a screened inside porch out onto the uh, open veranda out there, and they saw them, but from a different vantage point. And of course, I heard uh, peripherally their their uh, amazement as well as uh, expressions of, "Oh my gosh, what in the world can that be?" And they hung there, and they didn't they didn't burn out. They didn't dim and just disappear from view like you would expect uh, a flare or two. Uh, they just zipped and, and, and absolutely went completely below the horizon. And it was like somebody had switched a, a drag strip timer um, light on and the bars had fallen. So needless to say, it was one of those things that uh, I instantly said, those have got to be flares, but I had to rule them out almost in the same breath that I said the, the words myself. Wow. What a magnificent description, Tom. Uh, <clears throat> I knew before this program that we had a special guest, and you've just proven it. Uh, that was a wonderful description. You're, the the lights that you saw, you've described them beautifully. Were they or, oriented vertically? Or was the line of four lights oriented horizontally, or how, please? Peter, these lights, um, these lights were in a perfect horizontal alignment, absolutely even and level with the horizon that I could see of the Atlantic uh, in the nighttime. And as I've tried to think of some analogy or some similar description about what they look like, the best thing I can come up with is that they looked like bright orange marquee lights on the front of a Broadway theater. And if you can imagine four of them that appeared side by side by side by side, and again, using the, uh, the, the human limited distance of holding my flattened palm out in front of me out on the horizon, and then taking my pinky finger and sticking it up in the air, the globes would have been about the size of my little fingernail. And again, the thing that struck me about them was that they were so brilliant and, and, and they were so defined like one would expect when you walk into a, a bathroom at night and flip on the lights over your sink, the three or four lights that might be in a row on a bar. Uh, that's the way these things appeared. And they were so unnatural looking that I can't imagine even the, the, the best pyrotechnic expert in the world could have created flares that would have been shot from a, a ship in distress that would have all instantly uh, ignited and burned at the same intensity with the same, again, the word is incredible, this incredible orange glow from them that was very defined. And uh, not it was not a diffuse uh, circle at all. They were perfectly formed. They were... Uh, perfectly aligned, and they were perfectly brilliant, I can assure you. Wow. Could I uh, ask something here? I'm curious as to how, were the lights a light source, or did they have a definite shape? Oh, no, James, they had a definite shape. These were not projected beams. They weren't... Uh, lasers in the night they were they were orange globes and i mean the definition of each one of them was almost as if they were outlined with a black magic marker and and then someone had taken neon orange paint 
and and just planted them right in the middle of the sky. And of course, when they showed uh, any of the any of the ambient stars that one might see, and, and and it wasn't as I said a crystal clear night, but it was enough that you could see some of the majors that were out there. You could see Cygnus, and you could see. Uh, some others that I probably would misname anyway, but for my application, my star gazer application on my iPhone. But they they appeared, and I mean, I got tunnel vision looking at them uh, with just awestruck amazement at what I was seeing. Well, well they were as, yeah, as big as your fingernail. That would make them extraordinarily large and totally out of the realm of most conventional explanations. Yeah. My conclusion after seeing them is, is, is that they, they were unlike anything I could ever imagine unless uh, an Air Force uh, jet or something out there simply dropped these things that were tied together from a uh, silent aircraft up there that, that no one had heard or seen. Yeah. The interesting part of your sighting, Tom, excuse me for inter I interrupted somebody there, I apologize. The interesting part of your sighting is the apparent size of the four objects you were looking at. If indeed they were the apparent size of a human fingernail held at arm's length, that is a very, very large object if it's at a substantial distance from you. And for a flare to have had that apparent size, it would have had to be relatively close to you. If it had been launched from an aircraft, you would have been able to hear the aircraft. I, I presume I'm correct in saying that's conjecture, of course, but I too have seen flares launched from aircraft, and they are by no means that apparent size when they're at a great distance. And orange is a very, very unusual color for a flare. Usually they have magnesium and they just burn white hot so they are white or even slightly bluish well peter if i can let me let me see if i can give another example that maybe some of your listeners might identify with as well at halloween as my three children were growing up lots of times we would replace bulbs with orange light bulbs you could buy at a, a grocery store or a novel, novelty store and these these lights were so apparently light bulbs, not a, a, a burning dot. Uh, they were they were they were they were substantially too defined. The the circumference around them, or whatever you call the the, the radius around them, was just definite. Each of them were identical to the other. Uh, they were as perfect as one could imagine, as if you'd taken uh, completely round orange light bulbs that you would put into a fixture or a um, facade or somewhere outside, and the glow was, again, every bit as intense as if someone had just flipped the switch on, and they all came on. There was no, there was no variant in the degree to which they became hot, if that's a proper word. Uh, there was no variation in color. They were they, they were they were uh, quadruplets that were in perfect synchronicity with each other. No question about it. I remember that night because the UFO hotline received all sorts of reports just about the time the event was occurring from uh, both South Carolina as well as North Carolina. People could see them from up north of the, the border between the two Carolinas, well up north on the coast of North Carolina. And the interesting thing, Tom, and you and I have discussed this, and James and I have discussed this, the interesting part about this sighting is we've been receiving reports from that part of uh, South and North Carolina probably for three or four years, and I have been unable, unsuccessful in trying to explain what might be causing these lights? I have no idea. Well, it certainly, I'll, if I may, I, I'll go ahead and tell you that I did receive a phone call from the editor of the Coastal Observer, which is a local 
newspaper uh, down in that area that I love so much and I, I cherish and I'd do anything in the world to protect it. But this morning he called and told me that uh, as soon as a little article ran in the Coastal Observer that uh, these things had been seen and others had reported them as well, he got a phone call from uh, a, quote, official spokesperson, close quote, from Shaw Air Force Base in Sumter, North Carolina, who told him, oh, yeah, those are ours. Uh, those were flares. We've been doing nighttime training out there, and, in fact, we've alerted the Coast Guard every time we've been out there doing that so in case they got phone calls from, you know, other mystified beachgoers about the strange bright light, they, uh, they would be aware of them as well. Yeah. So, um, is there any confirmation that the Coast Guard actually received any information from a quote unquote official source? I, this is Tom. I, I, I don't know that, James. Uh, I do know that for a couple of days after that event on Wednesday the 8th, that we did check the local marine reports and various uh, other places we thought were a reasonable place to look for any reports of strange lights over the ocean. I can't tell you that we specifically looked at any Coast Guard sites, but we could find nothing that uh, had had sent an, quote, all's calm, um, you know, response back to anybody that it, they were just flares. Uh, we, we found none of that anywhere. Well, we've well, dealt with explanation ahead, before. I'm uh, One thing I wanted to, before I forget, when you say these four lights all came on together and they were all in a line, I gather that they all maintained the same relationship to each other. So I keep wondering if there's a possibility that all four lights were part of something larger. Well, again, let me go back to my, my bathroom light analogy. If you have one of the things you can buy from Lowe's or Home Depot or anything that is a bar, a horizontal bar that you can wire to the top of uh, your bathroom mirror or anything like that that would have four specifically uh, spaced equal size um, globes, white globes in this instance. These things were fixed. They were, they were in a, a, uh, a very vertical horizontal line. Uh, there was no variation between them, and if one had drawn a straight line between globe one to globe two to globe three to globe four, you would have a perfectly straight line that would have gone from the first to the fourth. And and when they came on, they were that way, and when they when they descended below the horizon, they they did not get out of parity with one another. They went straight down just like they were uh, uh, affixed to one another. And I, as I recall, uh, any sort of flare that's dropped from an aircraft, they put a small parachute on it to retard its descent. And I don't see any way that it would be possible to have four flares coming down that were equidistant from each other, coming down at a uniform rate at exactly the same time. I'm not sure that that's possible. Well, James, let me say this. If, if one could see through my eyes or through my uh, recorded memory of an event I will never ever forget one would rule that out because they were too perfect they 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 were they were too perfectly aligned they were too perfectly defined and they were too perfectly in in sync with each other and and again as you've ac accurately uh, analyzed it it was as if they were each affixed to an, an the, uh, another in some way, either by uh, radio, by uh, you know some metal attachment, or God knows what, but uh, their their ratio, their proportion to one another, was uh, invariant. Uh, it was fixed, and they were they were a team. I'm telling you, they were absolutely a unified team of four. Let me ask just a couple things that I think might help clarify the description for some of the audience. How far apart do you think these four lights were spread out? In other words, if you if you were the point of a compass, how many degrees of arc would it have taken to cover all four of those lights? 
and how high above the horizon were they? Well, you know, that's a that's an excellent question, and being a, uh, a non-mathematician, I did try to figure out where we were in relation to the horizon, and my initial thought was that we were probably 15 feet above the horizon, knowing that, uh, you know, from dead sea level, the, the horizon that you see is about 11.3 miles out there, then I, I roughly guessed, and uh, I have to make sure I've got my... My, my facts correct, but my report will clarify. But depending upon where they were in the cosmos, or, or certainly I did not see any reflections in the water. Uh, I saw nothing that gave me a point of reference of where they were if they were. I need to go to a break now so that we can repair, so that we can take up and hear the rest of your story, and we'll be back. And this is James Clarkson for EPIC, Extraordinary Phenomena Research Council, and hopefully we have resolved our audio difficulties and we'll be returning to our guest, Peter Davenport, the director of the National UFO Reporting Center, and our special guest, Tom. Hey, I'm James Glad. I'm glad we got that fixed uh, and, and repaired because it was just a little difficult to hear both of you gentlemen. Anyway, let me pick up real quickly where I was. I was talking about the phone call that my father made as a Marine Corps captain, former Marine Corps captain who saw uh, combat duty at Midway in uh, the Pacific Theater. And, again, I recalled this conversation so vividly because it was the first time in my life I had ever heard my father refer to himself as Marine Corps Captain X with certain unit fleet in the Pacific Theater at Midway with his uh, military ID number memorized by rote. And I sat there next to him as he made this report uh, as calmly as he could, but again, as, as firmly and with as much detail as possible describing the things that I was uh, perhaps inartfully trying to describe to you guys about what we saw that night. And I remember when Dad hung up the phone, he said, uh, they told me, Tom, that uh, they had uh, not, I was not the first caller that had called in on Christmas night. The others had seen the same thing and that they promised me as, you know, former Marine Captain X that they would certainly uh, notify me with any follow-up information. And certainly, uh, no letter or call ever came after that, so so we could probably surmise. But it was one of those events where there was nothing in the realm of any kind of other possibilities as the one we were previously talking about, like flares, that might have been a very reasonable explanation of the ocean. This was a specific celestial phenomenon that uh, it was as vivid as I told Peter, it was as vivid as if uh, one had taken a red laser pointer to a chalkboard in a darkened classroom and moved this thing across the, that dark class, that, ch that dark ch chalkboard uh, representing the sky. And I mean, it was moving with determination, it was moving with precision. It was moving at a speed that I could only imagine how it could crisscross that uh, that incredibly clear uh, East Tennessee Christmas night. And as I I've now said in hindsight, it was specifically as if it was using some technology to record GPS points in that sky, and once its job was done, it was gone. It was absolutely well, out of there. And again, uh, my father is, is, was even substantially more reserved and uh, focused about things that might be unexplained, that he would ponder and muse and this, that, and the other. But again, it was the first time I'd seen my father be less than totally composed in the face of something unusual. I've seen him attacked by old bandy hen roosters, and I've seen... Uh, a guy with a gun in his pocket that uh, pointed it straight at his belly, and my father absolutely took his wrist and uh, didn't didn't so much as break a smile and moved his hand out of the way and took control of the situation. But that one rattled my father. Well, when I say rattled, it it motivated him uh, to get back to that same Marine call and uh, 